The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. To me, what a sad place to go through life if you feel like there's nothing bigger, there's nothing better, there's nothing that can save you from all of this and the pain of this world, or that you are in charge of your life and you've made a mess of it. To me, to think there is a God in heaven and he will take our cares. He will take every struggle that we have. He wants to bear those burdens. To me. Shannon Breen explains how God used mothers and daughters in the Bible who, like us, altered and struggled to do their best. Next. But we welcome you to life today. Betty and I are thrilled to have Shannon Bream with us. She is, as I have actually told her and did just a few minutes ago when we just said hello, uh, because we're doing this on Zoom, but she is a radiant, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, manifestation of the glory and the grace and the love of God every time you see her. And she has, uh, you know, the women of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, Shannon, we, we really welcome you to life today. <laughs> we're so glad you're with us. Thank you. It's so great to be with you guys and just to see all the things you're doing around the world and just to be a small part of uh, the conversation with you today. Well, you know, this uh, book you wrote about uh, women of the Bible, <laughs> a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, and I've even heard you say and others say, you know, men need to read this too. Well, let me just go ahead and set the record straight. I didn't need to, to, to read it. She read it to me <laughs> because she would just get so excited and she would either be zealous with excitement or she'd be weeping. And so she's reading me your book. <laughs> and I can't help but think because husbands and wives oftentimes don't have the, the interactive relationship communication that they should have and that God wants us to have, it, this mm -hmm. could be a good way for him to go at it. So maybe the same is true here because she's already doing it here. <laughs> she can't hold it back. <laughs> does, does that please you to hear that? Yeah, I love to hear it. You know, my husband and I read together um, before bed every night where we read through on marriage and some verses and um, we read it aloud. And I think that it's a really special thing to share the joys of what you're discovering. Um, sometimes it's convicting and sometimes it's a good a reminder about what marriage should be and about how we should care for each other. Um, but we really enjoy that time together. It's pretty sacred to us. Well, I loved your first book, and like James said, I, I couldn't put it down because it, it kind of opened the door, I think, for a lot of women especially to hear about women in the Bible because in, the, in their journeys that God took them on because they were difficult journeys, especially for women mm -hmm. back through the Bible days. Um, they depended so much on, on their spouse or the, the community to really hold them up and help them. And they worked very, very hard. But this book, it, it really touched my heart in that it, it ministered to me personally in my relationships, my relationship with God. And I just thought it brought us into a time like, well, I can do that. I can do that. I can be like that if I have God first in my life. Things, goals that are obtainable. And I just, it blessed me so much. I love the story of, about uh, Naomi and Ruth mm -hmm. and the relationship that they had there. The, the love that Naomi showed Ruth as her daughter-in-law. She was her daughter-in-law. But as they traveled and they got to know each other and even Ruth went out of her own country, away from mm -hmm. her, her family to be with Naomi and the love that she saw in Naomi's heart. And I thought that's the way we could be as Christians. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have a platform, as you, you talked about. Evangelism isn't necessarily a platform. It's our life. It's where we live right now. So it really, bless mm -hmm. me. could you talk a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, exactly. These two women were bonded together in tragedy because Naomi was her mother-in-law and her, her husband died. And then both of her sons died, leaving these two women who were her daughters-in-law. Now all three of them widowed. And in those days, that was a very precarious position for a woman without a financial provider and without a physical protector. And now here there were the three of them. So Naomi tries again and again to get her daughters-in-law to go back, start a fresh family, go to their families. They can still have children, have a life together. And um, they're just weeping. And, and finally, her one Orpah, 
the one daughter-in-law goes home, mm-hmm. but Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you. Wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And we often hear that in the context of a wedding ceremony, but it's such a beautiful commitment saying, we're going to stick together in this. And it wasn't just that, as you point out, that Ruth chose to go with Naomi into her land and to her family, but Ruth said, your God will be my God. And that was a huge decision to leave behind the gods, small g gods of what of what she had grown up with and what would have been popular or familiar for her nation or her family. But they really bonded together in their relationship, but also in their faith. And that was the great denominator that took them through, you know, living on the edges of poverty and just really difficult times. But I do think that Naomi must have been in some ways a kind of evangelist. I mean, the (laughs) fact that her religion, her God, what she believed was so enticing and attractive to Ruth that she made that pledge to her um, is a very powerful thing. And I think it reminds us that just as you said, that we can live through our life, through our relationships with people, the way that they see we treat them and treat others can be a real, uh, just practical witness for Christ every day. You know, it's uh, amazing to see what God's done with the book. Were you, when you wrote Women of the Bible, you had hopes for it. Let me ask you, what was your initial hope for the book? Because you hope people buy the book, read the book. But what was your hope for the book to accomplish? Did you have kind of a a set focus on what you hoped the book would accomplish? You know, I'd never written a book like that before, and I just prayed over it. Lord, just I I pray that people, whoever gets this book or shares it or um, however it gets into their hands, that you would draw them to you, whether it's in the first time and trusting Christ as their Savior and understanding more of God's love and compassion through these stories, or if they're already a believer, to go deeper into these relationships and to see how God cares for us, how he's aware of every bit of our circumstances, and you're not alone if you're walking through suffering or a deep valley. So I I was really hopeful. And, it, you know, the book was written and came about in the first wave of really terrifying COVID where there was just so much we didn't know. And a lot of people were suffering in so many different ways. Um, I had no idea that people would connect with it so well. And I'm glad they did. I get messages from all over the world that people have shared it with friends or done a group Bible study because there are study questions in there uh, with their church or just a book group in the neighborhood. And I've had men say to me that they've read it too and, and or read through it with their daughters and wanted to share it. So I I think the reach was far beyond what any of us truthfully had expected, but was just really grateful. Um, And I pray over this book and every word of it the same way. Well, did it surprise you how well it went? Did you find yourself a little bit overwhelmed that it took off like it did and the Mm -hmm. feedback was so uh, profoundly positive? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, we always lecture ourselves. I say, Lord, help me not to worry about the earthly success of this book or what man, um, how they rate it or what they do with it or how they rank it. Um, But there's a part of me um, as a human being that was startled when it ended up number one on the New York Times bestseller list. I was like, praise the Lord. (laughs) Um, And it really, to me, it's just a God thing. There's no other way to explain it, that people, um, that it would stay there for weeks and weeks, uh, that people, it, it resonated with them and hopefully met a need that they really had when I think, as you guys know, when there's tragedy, hearts are more open a lot of times that um, people are searching. And I think last year was one of those times. Well, and I think this book's going to do just as well or maybe even better than your first book. And I loved your first book. But you also uh, shared the story of Moses' mom and his sister (laughs) and their journey that they went on. And just the great love and the courage that that mom had to have to give her son up, to put him in that basket that she especially made to keep him from drowning and and keep him safe. But also the sister, the great protection she had over her brother as he journeyed down that stream, not really knowing what would happen particularly, but knowing that God had a hand on him. I know when you told Mm -hmm. me this story, it really touched your heart in a way that you said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to share that. What was it that moved you so deeply that you had a hard time even talking to me about it? Well, yesterday when we were talking, it it was back on the, the other story of Naomi and Ruth and just the great love that that Naomi showed her and she didn't preach to her she just lived mm-hmm. her life as an example and I think sometimes so many people think well I have to have a pulpit to do it I have to have an audience to do it no God says let me do it through you and you mm-hmm. just walk the life and the journey and the purpose that I have in your life and no it's not always going to be fun it's not going to always be smooth Jesus 
journey wasn't smooth at all, but he continued mm -hmm. with what, what God had told him he was to do. And that's the way with most of it. And you, you know, isn't it amazing? I think you brought that out in this book is the things that we ch that challenge us, the tragedies even that we can go through are the things where we learn the most lessons. And that's hard sometimes to understand, but God gets our attention and he knows that great truth he'll speak to our hearts during this time. We've known that because in the loss of our daughter several years ago, the mm -hmm. heartache that we went through. But boy, did the, the relationship with God grow? Yes, it did. Because our hearts were receptive to his will and his purpose for our life. You know, Jesus mm -hmm. said when he made his announcement of why he was here, and he talked a lot about freedom, which I've preached, and about how we all seek that and know he's the only source of it, and we all have battles of defeat. Uh, let the, every mouth be stopped, all the world become guilty before God. There's none perfect. He uses the imperfect to accomplish his perfect will. And we so need that love and that forgiveness. And that is what was being seen in the commitment and the love for one another that was unshakable. And I think what God is using people to do like you, because I think, like I said, when we began the show, you are a radiant display of the father's life and the father's love. I think if we would show a fatherless world, a world that's been taught there isn't a creator father, there isn't a God, there are no absolute truths. If we would show people the family of that father, I think people would run to that father. They're not impressed with religion, but they'd be impressed with a meaningful, life-fulfilling relationship. And I think that's what really your books, I think it's what your testimony does every time we see you. It, it is a magnificent display of the light of God, the love of God, the glory of God, the grace of God. Why don't we show a sick world that is literally about to explode, why don't we show them what happens when we get in the shelter and shadow of the Almighty and let the Lord be our shepherd and lead us to the green pastures and restore us and heal the broken hearts. Can't you get excited about that? That sounds like the next awakening to me, and that's <laughs> exciting. Yes, and I would love to see that. I mean, his mercy that covers us, the promises, his faithfulness um, in a world that is so searching. There's so much evil in the world and pain uh, and, and people that are hell bent on destruction of life lives and of good things. And I, to me, what a sad place to go through life. If you feel like there's nothing bigger, there's nothing better. There's nothing that can save you from all of this and the pain of this world, um, or that you are in charge of your life and you've made a mess of it to me to think there is a God in heaven. Good will triumph over evil. He promises us all good things, the best possible ending in the world. And he will take our cares. He will take everything that besets us and every struggle that we have. He wants to bear those burdens to me. That is great news. That is powerful news that everything that we ever suffer or struggle with, and the Bible tells us Christ understands all of it. He walked this earth and suffered in every way as we did and as we do. So we don't have a high priest who does not understand that suffering, and whether it's temptation, physical, um, you know, financial, family disasters, whatever the problems are, he gets it. Nothing is new to him. So what a relief for those of us who trust him and, and know that there's great mercy. I need his forgiveness every every day. There is great unconditional love and power in all that he promises. So why not run to that? I mean, to me, what a great relief, everything that we chase on this earth. And listen, I get distracted by social media and all kinds of fun things on this planet and things that are good. I mean, even service in church or whatever you're doing, but anything that gets in the way of him will only be short-term joy or happiness. Many of the things that we turn to in this world will lead us to long-term destruction and pain that is even worse than what we were trying to escape in the first place. So what a comfort to me uh, that God is a God of forgiveness and mercy and grace and all good things and that he will triumph. So why not sign up for that team where he will take the worst of us and give us uh, the very best in return? There's no other um, situation or deal you could ever make that would be better than that. You know, I want to I say something very directly to the audience right here. You didn't just hear religious talk just now. You heard about relationship, a relationship with a very real person, our Father in heaven who created us, and the Savior, the Son that he gave to redeem us as fallen man, 
who disregarded his life, who didn't enter into the promised land and continued to live in the shelter and shadow with the watch care of the ultimate shepherd who could protect us from the wolves and the beasts of the field and the Goliaths that come against us. And we don't have to have the armor and protection of the world we have his. That's where he invites us to live. And yet we rebel, but he gave his son to redeem us. And, and literally, Shannon, what happened is we actually were born into this family with a spiritual birth. And what you were talking about was not religious. It wasn't traditions of men. It wasn't the tradition of men taught us the commands of God or ignoring the commands of God. You were talking about relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with others, relation with the people who don't understand people that we love because God loves them and he wants to love them through us. We don't need to be angry at defeated people. We're all defeated people. And he wants to lead us into a freedom that is so far beyond religion. People are not running to religion because it too often divides us as seriously as political uh, boundaries divide us and, and the partisanship divides us. You were talking about relationship. Your books talk about relationship. This is what the Father is inviting us into, a relationship with the living God, with the King of Kings, and to be the family in the shelter and shadow of that Father with the perfect shepherd protecting us and guiding us and blessing us and restoring our soul and being with us in every dark valley and moving the mountains and anointing our head with all of his presence, his love and his power. That's what I see coming out of you. That's what you write about. And from the bottom of our heart, we thank God and we thank you yeah. for being a source of inspiration to everyone in some of the most challenging places on this planet, in the news world. And we love you and we thank God for you. I pray everybody gets the book. I pray the women will read it to their husbands. <laughs> They'll go back and forth and grow because it teaches men to, and you make that very clear in this particular book. Thank you so much for being a blessing. Thank you both. God bless you, all the work that you're doing and the truth that you're sharing too. Great to see you. Well, we're going to talk to our viewers about something they love. One thing they know, if they watch James and Betty on Life Today, they're going to be challenged to share life today every day. And we share with the least of these, the most overlooked, forgotten people. And our viewers love it. They have become an answer to people's prayer and the miracle that people long for. And our viewers love that. So we're going to talk to them about feeding hundreds of thousands of children in desperate need. And we're going to also add to the other gifts that we bring your book today. If they will give a child something to eat and put God's hands of love on people, we're going to be blessing them with your book too. And you are a blessing to us. And we're going to be praying for you all the time. And I know you're going to be praying for us. I will. And thank you. It's it's a wonderful honor to be any small part of what you guys are doing and changing lives is um, we were talking about but for eternity, some of these folks you'll meet in heaven and they'll be able to trace back to the people that were kind enough to join you in this and to support um, really changing lives in practical ways, us being the hands and feet of Christ, mm -hmm. um, not just with great platitudes and, and encouraging words, but really showing up where people have enormous daily needs to sustain their lives. Well, we're going to look in on some of that right now and you'll see it and everybody's going to watch, but we're going to be the miracle they need and your prayers and your support mean so much to us. I want you to watch right now. All of you just please right now. I want you to look into a setting that's very real right now. And I want you to know you are, listen to me, God's love through you. You're the solution. You're the miracle they long for. You're the answer to their hopes and prayers. Watch closely. James and Betty, last time we were in Mozambique together, we were walking through schools where mission feeding was happening. There were children dancing and singing and just life, life because of mission feeding in those villages, because of the friends of life, because of each and every one of them opening their hearts, partnering with you, partnering with us to make that joy and that life possible for each and every one of those children. I, I remember it like it was just yesterday. And I remember how filled with joy your heart was in seeing those children thriving, full of joy and full of energy. And all of that starting with just a bowl of food a day in the mission feeding program in their schools, changing their lives, providing them with opportunity. But James, as you know all too well, life is hard here in Africa for many of these families, you know, with 
the drought that we've experienced. We've seen areas where they're just they're unable to produce food. And what it's resulted in is a severe critical need, a need that is putting children in malnutrition clinics. I've seen some of the fullest malnutrition clinics I think I've ever seen in this area. We've seen children, many of them, who I don't think will make it. A name on a little wooden cross, another life stolen by malnutrition, stolen by the simple lack of food. James, we have to do something about this. We've got to reach these children now. It's urgent, it's critical. We have to get to them now because if we don't get to them now, they're gonna to continue to dig more and more of these graves and bury more and more of these children. Please, James, ask the friends of life. Ask them to help you and to help us so that we can save these lives. I can remember the first time, Betty, we knelt by those little graves. But they were tiny graves and they were digging them rapidly. It didn't take long. And it was obvious they were for children. And so I began to meander through where maybe there were a thousand, two thousand graves that were there. And they didn't even have a suitable marker. They had kind of a memory. And, and Betty, it was so horrific that we talked to our viewers and to be honest with you, let me just say this straight. We didn't know that people would help. We knew we would. But a miracle occurred. And Betty, we went back about two or three years after the death cycle of thousands being buried. And we went to a church that was a school. And the children were just beautiful. And they were singing and they were so happy. And the pastor, he was a, a little guy. He said, because you fed us, now these children are alive and they're in church and they're, they're learning English and, and they're learning and they're so happy you hear them singing. And as we walked away to go back into the mission vehicles, the little pastor stopped Peter Pretorius. And you know, this is like, you know, 25 or 30 years ago. And he said, I guess you, and he's crying. He said, I guess y'all not coming back anymore because you see the children. And they're not hungry now, they're going to school. And he said, if you quit feeding them, they won't come to school because they come here now to get food. And Betty, that's what started school feeding. And we told that little pastor, we're not ever gonna not come back. This is the process of love and life. Not Pharaoh, not Caesar, not Uncle Sam, not a government, but the love of God. And, and this is what you do. Listen, your love, God's love through you changes everything. And right now the situation in Angola is worse than it was then. The graves that were dug as those children were dying before we reversed it in certain areas are now being dug in new areas and they're about to have the same crisis because the situation's actually worse. So here's what I'm asking you to do. We have found the people that have the need. If you would make a gift of 30, 50 or hundred dollars, you would feed three, five or 10 children for the next month. And dear God, if you could give a thousand dollars, you'd feed a hundred. We're going to send you some gifts. We, we will send you along with the other gifts. We're also going to send you Shannon Bream's book. It will be a blessing to all of you. Would you do this right now? Would you go get your bank card? Would you use it like a check? Would you go online and say, here's my gift? I'm always going to ask you if you can possibly feed 10 make the $100 gift, but three for 30, five for 50, or could you feed 100? Whatever you can do, do it. If you want to write a check, make it to life, but call us and tell us you're mailing it. And by the way, you can use that card by dialing the number. Father, please help everyone who can help to help right now. We need a miracle in order to help. They need a miracle in order to live. You can be that miracle. Please be the miracle they long for. Across the continent of Africa, children are suffering, facing severe malnutrition and even death. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish supplies to keep feeding the 350,000 children who are counting on us. 
through Life's Mission Feeding Outreach, your gift of love can be an answer to prayer for a hurting and hungry child in their time of need. Call now with your life-saving gift of $30, $50, or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or ten children for three full months. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the chosen 40 Days with Jesus. From the creators of the widely popular television drama, The Chosen, this devotional invites you to discover Jesus through the eyes of those who knew him best. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Amazing Grace Sheet Music Frame Wall Art. This timeless and well-beloved hymn can be displayed as a reminder of God's grace to you. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Let the Children Come. This beautiful bronze is a reminder to care for children around the world in both word and deed. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. My prayer is that we haven't reached this child too late. My prayer is that the therapeutic food that we're bringing this child will save its life. But my other prayer is that we're able to reach the many mothers in villages all over this area, just like Marta, mothers who are so desperate for food that we can reach them before their children end up in malnutrition clinics. You can be an answer to that prayer. You can provide the resources today to enable our mission teams to bring that food to these villages, to bring food to mothers like Marta. So please, I'm asking you today to go to the phone or get online and give the very best gift that you can give. Give the gift of food. Give the gift of life. Well, I know you've been blessed by the program, and I want to say to all of you watching, we're going to send you mothers and daughters. Now, we've got the, the chosen. And this is literally 40-day devotionals from those who wrote The Chosen and presented it, how powerful that, that series is. But this is just great. But we're going to send you, if you help us feed these children, whatever gifts you make, we're going to send you Shannon's book too. And you can go online, tell your friends to get it. It'd be good if your neighbors got it. Shannon, thank you for being a blessing. You come and be with us. Anytime you've got something on your heart you want to share with an audience beyond Fox, well, you just call us. You've got a place right here, Amen. okay? Thank you so much. And I hope next time I'll see you in person. Yes, yeah, well, God bless you guys. Too. We want you great. to. God, really bless you. God bless you. And thank all of you for your help. Thanks for giving life today. We do all have an assignment, we all have a role to play, but we were made for communion with God. We were made to walk with God. At the table with Jesus, tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.